Imagine you were the president of a fast-growing civil engineering company. What would you do? What would you work on every day? How would you try to pull the company together and keep them together going in the same direction? Well, these are the topics that our guest for today, Peter Moore, president of Chen Moore & Associates, is going to dive into. Peter has been doing this for a long time and he really understands how civil engineering companies grow, but what he understands even better than that is that people are the most important aspect of growing a firm. And that's what he's going to cover in this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast. Let's jump right in. This Civil Engineering Entrepreneurs series is brought to you by Big Time. Big Time is the industry leading PSA software providing time tracking, billing, and project management for engineering firms with the goal of getting your business back to business. You can learn more about Big Time's PSA solution at bigtime.net. All right, so now I'd like to welcome on our guests to the podcast today Peter Moore, who I just introduced to you, president of Chenmore and Associates. Peter, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Peter, I introduced you, of course, to our listeners early on, but in your own words, uh, tell them a little bit more about kind of what you do on a daily basis at Chenmore and your role. Sure. I appreciate it, Anthony. This is such a fun question because my day varies so much from day to day. Some days I'm a CEO engaging with other business leaders, and some days I'm a lobbyist trying to ensure local, state, or national policies are in line with what we, what we want to see going on. Um, Still other days on marketing clients, and honestly, I do still spend a lot of time still as a supervisory engineer, um, reviewing plans and you know mm. moving forward in our meetings and making sure things get set up the right way. My favorite part, and really my one of my favorite sayings is that you know I, I love to I love to engage with students and younger members. Those are my favorite days because it really helps me refuel my tank because it helps me remember why I got into this business overall. And uh, probably one of the best examples is that for 20 years, um, uh, a group and I have, have done the uh, judging of the ASE Concrete Canoe for a regional competition. And for a lot of people who grew up in the civil engineering world, they know what Concrete Canoe is. Um, but for 20 years, we, we went through both judges together to make sure that the judges were more, uh, were, were, were more in line with the rules than the students. And I had a really embarrassing moment about 20 years ago when I first started is that I just came down because we were a sponsor of the competition. And when, uh, when we got there, we realized that the students and the faculty members knew so much more than the judges did. So a couple, couple folk and I, we just started following around the competition. And then about 17 years ago, I got asked uh, by, alma, by my alma mater to be the head judge. And then I put together a team that made sure that every single team that went through that concrete canoe um, that, that, that won our competition was going to compete in the national competition. So we took it just as seriously as the, as the students did. But, you know, the crazy part about that is reviewing those papers and reading those mixed designs and everything else just, just wears on you. And every yeah. year you wonder whether or not you're going to do it again. And, uh, but it's funny, you watch the, you know, you watch the races and you watch the presentations and really and truly though, you watch, you watch them win their awards and just how excited students are about it. That's what, that's what keeps you coming back. So those are my favorite days is when I can give back to the students and younger members. Yeah, that's great. And, and I want to dig in a little bit more on that, Peter, because obviously you're very busy. You're running the company. You are running for ASC or you're nominated for ASC president-elect in 2021, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, among other things. And, you know, everyone has to, kind of think about their time management and where they're focused. You know, a lot of people are kind of, you know, over leveraged. How do you personally kind of make sure that you're working on like the right things each day? Like when you come to work, I'm sure you deal with a lot of things that come up that you don't even know you're going to deal with that day, but how do you try to focus your time effectively? Sure. That's a, it's a fantastic question because um, everyone feels overwhelmed at any, in any given state and time. I, I really think that busy is a state of mind and you're never too busy when there's a purpose to your actions. So, you know, a little secret to my success when I was early in my career is, honestly, I had a lot of time. Um, I, I went from a time when I was in college, man, I went to school full time, I worked full time, I played in a band, I went out seven nights a week, I had a 
very full social schedule. I, I loved everything that I was doing when I was in school. And, but when I graduated, I realized I was nowhere near as busy as I was when I was in school. And as a result, um, I just found myself having a lot of time to dedicate towards things. And uh, when I first became a partner here at, at Chen Moore, it was called Chen Associates back then. Note the name got added because I worked really hard. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I used to work every Sunday because I took on most of the administrative roles in the company. I took on accounting. I took on IT. Um, I took on a lot of those administrative roles. And I would do those on Sundays to make sure that I could effectively work during the week. So, you know, I've, I've just worked more than a lot of people. And so that's a, you know, it's not something people a lot of times want to hear, mm -hmm. but I have spent a lot of time just, just, just dishonestly working. But today, you know, I, and you and I talked about this earlier, but I think before the camera started rolling, but, you know, family is super important to me now. And spending time with my daughter is incredibly important to me and watching her grow up. Um, I had her when I was 42. So I had a lot of time before I was a father. Hmm. Um, but, you know, now instead of doing everything, I'm a, I'm a lot about making choices, you know, about, you know, who I work with, who I spend my time with, and who I invest my time with. So I think that every day in the morning I wake up, um, I wake up very early still. Um, I'm a five o'clock in the morning guy. So again, those that sleep in late, I'm sorry. You know, it's sorry. It's not, it's not how I work. I'm a five o'clock in the morning guy. But by the time I've already had my shower, I've already decided what the first, you know, 15 or 20 things I'm going to do with my day are. And the rest of my day just kind of happens to me. So, you know, I think in order to do that, you, you really need to prioritize who you're going to spend your time with, what you're going to do. Um, and, and that sort of thing. So I think that's kind of what my, what, what my process is. Yeah, no, that's great. And it, and it's, it's great hearing you talk about your daughter. Cause sometimes we have to have like a life altering event to really, you know, make us appreciate all of our time and think about our time and how we're focusing it and how we're spending it. And yeah, you know, I have three young kids and you know, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, I'm, I'm also a, a 5.00 AM guy, I get up early and I try to get a couple of big things done in the morning. Cause I know, you know, like you, you know, things are going to happen during the course of the day that you don't plan for. So you need some space to be able to get those big things done, or at least identify a couple of the first things you want to accomplish before, you know, other things tend to creep in. And so, you know, I appreciate you sharing I remember, that process. I remember that commercial when we were kids, um, you know, if you're in the army, you get more done before 8 a.m. than most yeah. people do all day. Right. And that sticks in my head. I'm just like, yeah, no, seriously. I mean, on the weekends, you know, before my wife even wakes up with my daughter, I mean, I've already I've already been at Target. I've already done laundry. I've already mopped the floor. I've already done the dishes. I've already, you know, there's so many things that I've already done um, that, you know, if I if I slept in, it, it just wouldn't work for me. So I just it's just not me. I'd rather just get up and get my stuff done. No, you're right. And I actually just had this conversation with someone because I was saying like, you know, they say sometimes when you, you get up early. Why well, are you tired? I said, you know what? I tried to sleep in thinking like I'll feel better because I'm a little bit more refreshed. But what happens is I feel more stressed because I lose that time where I get all the big things done and then I'm worried about getting stuff done. So, yeah. you know, it's like everything in life, there's a balance, but I'd rather, you know, get a little bit less sleep and be more productive and feel a little less stressed than the, the reverse way around. Everyone's different, but that's, that's what's worked for me. And it sounds like yeah. we've got similar. I'm, I'm, I'm in the same boat, man. I, I'm just not that guy that's going to be, you know, killing myself at 10 o'clock at night. I'd rather, right. You know, okay. That's what we're going to tackle in the morning, you know, kind yeah. of thing. Exactly. So, Peter, there are a lot of challenges that one faces when you're growing a company and growing a company fast. And and I know Chen Moore, you know, from talking to you and some of your colleagues that, you know, you guys are growing pretty quickly. Um, so talk about, you know, every company encounters, you know, challenges, problems. I mean, even engineers, that was what we do every day. So as you're growing so quickly, you know, what does the process look like for you where you need to say, okay, here's a challenge we have to deal with now at this stage of our growth. You know, how do you identify those challenges and, and kind of attack those when you're moving so fast? Sure. Well, let, let, let me first take a step back and say, you have to realize that in general, growth isn't something that you necessarily can plan for. Um, growth kind of happens to you. Now you put in place the right environments, you put in place the right, you know, you, you start to look at mergers and acquisitions and you start doing these things, but really and truly growth just kind of happens. It's this thing that over time just kind of comes up and, you mm -hmm. know, you catch a good day or you catch a bad day. It's kind of like going surfing, you know, sometimes some days there are good waves and some days there aren't good waves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to be able to make sure that you're there for the times that the good waves are around. 
So that's what growth is about. And the last couple of years for us have been, you know, have been really good. Um, I, I appreciate that. And, um, but we, we had planned for that. You know, a lot of these things, we put in place an infrastructure that made sure that we had, you know, accounting and marketing and IT, and, uh, a management structure that allowed each of our groups to grow. So, you know, really and truly, I think growing in general is all about your people. It's all about your people. And if you don't trust the people you're working with, you shouldn't even bother to grow because you'll be disappointed. So I really think that the, the way in which, you know, you start to identify and solve problems is it comes down to those, you know, to, to that level of that level of employee that you, you put in charge of these, these parts of growth, whether it be your project managers or office managers or that sort of thing. If they're not the right people, then you've already made your, you know, you've already, you, you're basically already behind the eight ball. And I think it's the people that bring those things to my attention because I, I have a process where, you know, we have a, we have a weekly call. Of course, everybody talks to each other on a weekly call. Everybody has a weekly management meeting, right? Um, I do a, I used to do a management by walking around. Everybody talks about that. You used to be able to walk around the office. Well, in COVID times, what do you do? You can't walk around your office. We have, we have multiple offices. We have seven offices. So I can't walk around all seven offices, right? right. Um, but I will tell you that every time I'm driving to a meeting, I kind of go through a, a select thing where I call my project managers, my office managers, just, just to reach out. And, you know, from there, we find out a lot about, um, you know, a lot about what's going on. And, I, and I'm really excited to have those conversations. Um, sorry if you hear the train in the background. We're really proud to be on, on mass transit here in Florida, which is a really difficult thing to do, but we're right here on mass transit. So <laughs> no, no, no problem. And, and I like what you said there in terms of, you know, I mean, scaling a company for all intents and purposes, you're thinking that's great. You're scaling, you're growing, but at the same time, if you scale too fast, you can encounter some, some problems that can really set you back. And so it sounds like, you know, creating some really good, well thought out systems, like you mentioned, and then of course, having the people, the right people kind of overseeing and driving those systems and processes are really important. And I, I say that because the civil engineering industry has generally done well. And I've talked to a lot of companies that are doing well. And I do find that that is a challenge sometimes is that, you know, keeping up with the work. Um, again, it sounds like a good problem to have, but if you become really overwhelmed, things can break. And that's when you want, you go kind of backwards, take a step back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I totally agree with that. Um, it's, it's funny because the guy who works in the office literally right behind me was celebrating his 20th year today. And um, I've been with the company 21 years. I've been with the company since we were three people. He's been here since we were six. Um, I've seen everything change. And when we were 10 people, we could do things one way. When we were 25 people, we could do things one way. We were 60 people, we could do it a different way. You know, now we're 80, you know, we're, we're shooting for, you know, to become 100 or 120 people. We have to, we just have to make some different decisions. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that, you know, as an, as an owner, as a leader, you're not going to make every decision. So if you're a micromanager, get out of this business. Just go, get out. Like it's not going to work for you because you have to realize that you're hiring people and you're putting them in places to make good decisions for you. And if you don't hire the right people, then, then you're also in trouble. So, you know, you need to be a great judge of talents and you also need to be a great delegator when it comes to trying to grow a company. Yeah, no. And that's, unfortunately, that delegation piece is one that a lot of uh, technical professionals, we sometimes struggle with because, you know, like you said, you all start doing the reports and the technical writing. And then all of a sudden one day you're like, I can't do that anymore. What do you mean? What, what am I supposed to do? And you kind of got to go through that process. We all have to go through that transition process, but I feel like those that can kind of get it down quicker, you know, can really do well in terms of growing. However, that being said, you know, I think all companies have some really core processes, you know, whether it's sales, marketing, delivering, you know, great projects, hiring. Talk about the importance of, you know, documenting those processes or creating those processes um, as opposed to just kind of winging those processes, especially as you're growing at a rapid pace so that you have some consistency throughout your company when you have offices. Sure. Um, well, I'll, for, the first thing I'll say is, you don't grow for very fast or very long if you don't take care of the fundamentals. Um, you know, the fundamentals are all about what engineering is all about. We, 
first and foremost, our business is about the public safety, health, and well-being of every human being on the planet. So, you know, if you don't take care of the fundamentals and you don't take care of that first, then obviously you won't go very far. Um, recently, uh, though, we've, we've hired a director of quality assurance. Um, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had another person in the company who was there. We developed a QAQC program probably, I don't know, a decade ago. We, we, we spruced it up about five years ago to make it look great in our marketing materials. And we do utilize it. But what we wanted to do is we want to make sure it was utilized as a fundamental part of our business. And so that's the reason why we hired someone not to do the actual reviews and checks, but to facilitate them getting completed and documented. So that was so important for us because as a, you know, when I was, when we were, again, like I said, when we were a 20 person company, I had my eyes on everything that was going on. Actually, um, the way that our company developed, we had two main offices. Uh, we're, our, we were headquartered in Fort Lauderdale and we had a relatively large office in Miami. But in Miami, the founding partner of the firm, Dr. Chen, um, the number two guy who's the 20 year guy who's now behind me back here and the number uh, and the other uh, basically our number one, number three and number four people in our company were in the Miami office. And I was here in the Fort Lauderdale office by myself. I ran the larger office, but I was able to see everything that was going on in the other office. Of course, I trusted number one, number three, number four to be able to do everything. It's not the same now. You know, it's not the same now. We have 13 project managers. Those project managers manage somewhere between 10 and 35 projects. Mm -hmm. Obviously, those that manage 35 projects are managing much smaller projects or much longer term projects. Um, but for us, it's, it's really important for, you know, for that documentation to be done because we have, a, I mean, pre-COVID, but, you know, now after COVID happens, we have a lot of work sharing. So it's really important for us to be able to document what we're doing. If we have to switch out engineers, we have to switch out landscape architects, we have to switch out designers. That's really important. Um, you know, what's required for having a few people to be involved in the process is much different when, when you're a larger company. And then, you know, and then you also start getting down to, I'm really into risk management. And, you know, whenever we have a problem, I really like to look at that problem as calling it a quote unquote teaching moment for the project manager or individual, or sometimes even for myself. So, you know, what, that's basically what we look for in, in these, in these times. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I, I think I captured. Yeah, no, for sure. Your question there. Sorry. No, think, for sure. I think I rambled a little bit there and I apologize. No, no, no. So going back to what you said about the, I think you said it was like a quality control you know, professional, someone that you mm -hmm. hired uh, roughly like what, how many people are, what size was the, was the firm at that point, Peter? Yeah, we were about, uh, we were just about 75 people. Okay. When we, when we decided to make that move, um, you know, the individual fortunately was very well known to a number of our senior staff um, and was, you know, he, he himself was in the middle of switching career, you know, switching jobs and things. And it just, some of those right place, right time things. I literally wrote in my own, uh, CEO review. So I report to a board of directors. I don't think I said that before. Um, I report to an outside board of directors and uh, because they have the fiduciary responsibility for the shareholders. And one of the things that I wrote for myself was I wanted to make sure that we had an ex uh, a third party, not a third party, but a, a, an internal QAQC uh, person. And so really it was just a absolutely perfect timing that I probably finished my review and a month later he became available and we, we put it in, you know, he's got 35 years of experience. He's uh, absolutely a great fit for us. It's Fits great. our company culture very well. Um, yeah. You know, I, I couldn't be happier with what's going on. No, that's great. And, and the reason kind of I was following up on that is because I have found in working with a lot of uh, companies of different sizes that one, one pitfall is not having someone like that in place early on enough to get some consistent standards across the company because it gets to a point, as you know, I'm sure, when you have enough offices and different project managers that are doing things their own way before you establish something standard, then it almost becomes like really hard to get people on the same page. And so, you know, I really want to drive that point home for our listeners out there that might be running their own civil companies or thinking about it or wherever they're at in their careers that 
you know, if you're growing a company, you want to have that consistency. And I understand it's hard to do in the beginning because you're just in the beginning, you're getting going. Like you said, you're maybe doing everything. You're trying right. to get it going, but there does come a point, And I think you need to identify that point where you, where you, whether it's a person or a department or some kind of standards that you need to start to set becomes very important in terms of the long-term growth of the firm, from my experience. Absolutely. You know, and what we, we, we felt early on is that you know, we have a vice president of operations and we felt that person could potentially have that role, but they just got to be too busy. Um, we hired a CAD manager very early on. Maybe we were 30 people, 35 people. We had a CAD manager, but that's because we have such a significant work share going on. I mean, you know, we have at any given day, we have 50 different people using, using some variety of CAD. And we wanted to make sure that our standards were in place because, again, we have a lot of work share going on there. But to have a fundamental, you know, schedule, budget, you know, overall QAQC program is something that, um, you know, we felt was really important. And honestly, I think it's a huge benefit to us. And I think it's a huge benefit to our clients. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I want to drill down a little bit more. You mentioned a word a few minutes ago. That's an important word for anyone building a company, which is culture. And, you know, people talk about the company having a mission, a vision, and some people would classify it as a purpose or a culture. And I think one of the things that's important in building a company is ensuring that that culture or, or the you know the mission or the vision of the company is really apparent throughout the company. And the company, when they take actions, it's kind of tied back to that. And I'm just wondering how at Chenmore, you kind of, you know, you build that culture and you kind of carry that through your company. So it's funny because, uh, you know, I received some early questions from you that were talking about mission and vision. We do have a mission statement and a vision statement and everybody's gone through that exercise. They aren't as important to us necessarily as the idea that really and truly we, we feel that we're a family business. And to us, being a family overtakes so many and it really helps us drive a lot of decisions. Hey, do you want to make more money this year? Or do you want to increase the amount that we're going to spend towards family insurance? It's a no-brainer. There's a lot of things that we do that really just drive towards the fact that, you know, are we actually family? No. In many cases, we actually have two married couples that work for us. But, <laughs> um, uh, you know, are we actually family? No. But we really want to treat our folk like they were our family and like you would, you would expect to be treated yourself. And so that's really important to us is that we've never really been a numbers first kind of company. Um, I think that's what helps you grow. Uh, you know, I mean, really and truly, if all you ever worried about is squeezing every last dime out, then you wouldn't be investing in your people. Um, you know, you wouldn't have the best benefits. You wouldn't have the best things. Um, you know, gosh, going back to the downturn, going back to the Great Recession, um, whether or not it was a, a stroke of genius on his part or a stroke of uh, befuddlement on my part, I became president of the company January 1st, 2018. And uh, so Dr. Chen chose a, a very special year to name me as president of the company. So I've been, you know, I've been, I've been running this ship for 13 years now. And, you know, the only year we ever had a layoff, the only year we ever lost money was 2008. And the only year we ever had a layoff was 2009. Um, wow. And those were two very harsh lessons that I needed to learn very early on in my presidency. I was 32 and 33 years old when that happened. Wow. So to, uh, to put things in perspective, I was not, you know, I was not a seasoned professional when it came to that. Um, so I think, you know, really and truly, I, I think that the greatest piece of advice I heard after all that, and it's funny now because the, the fellow uh, who gave this piece of advice to me is now a president of a contracting company who we do some work with and I battle with sometimes and everything else, but he was an employee of ours at the time. And he said to me, he goes, Peter, I know you're really depressed because you just lost 11 jobs. And he said, but remember, you saved 21 jobs. Hmm. And when he said that to me, um, it, it struck home to the point where I said, I'm never going to doubt my mission. My mission is to keep the company in business. My mission is to keep the company around because anybody who wants to stick around and wants a job, I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my purpose in life is to make sure that these great people have a great place to land. And unfortunately, that particular time, we couldn't keep everybody, but knock on wood, that'll never happen again. And, you know, we're continuing to do our best to make sure that happens. We've done a lot of things through diversification, other things that I can get into, but um, 
I feel we're much, much better prepared, but I, I will, I will thank my friend Andres for that day that he said to me, you, you saved 21 jobs. You didn't lose 13 jobs or whatever the number was. Yeah, I mean, no, that's very powerful. And, and what I think is really interesting about that whole, you know, your, your backstory there, Peter is, you know, I could only think of how it would have been different if you started on a much higher, a better economy and then had something like that happen down the road. It's almost like at the time it probably sucked, but it was almost better in that, you know, you had a, you had a hard education early on and I'm sure that like, well, it did cause you just told us it did, but it left a real imprint on you and probably drove the way you made decisions and the way you did things going on, going forward. So there are two really big things about that. I think the first was I became a partner of the business in 2002. And, you know, in about 2003, 2004, there's a little blip in the market. And, you know, for those of you who are younger, you may not remember this. It was some weird stuff happening as a, you know, as a byproduct of the dot-com bubble bursting or some other things that were going on. The economy just kind of froze for a bit. And as a result, um, things slowed down for our firm. Uh, I don't even remember particularly why. And I Unfortunately, it wasn't that well aware of what was going on, um, you know, with us, with us financially. I hadn't really delved into the finances yet. But Dr. Chen and I both froze our salaries for six months. And I'll tell you, as a 28-year-old, mm. you're probably not going to be prepared to not take a salary for six months. Now, we had had a, you know, decent year the year before, and I had bought a relatively low-cost condo, and I could, I could live pretty cheaply. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, so I, I was given a very harsh lesson in entrepreneurship very early on when it came to that. Um, the second lesson, though, that I'll say is, God, was it so easy to be a vice president of a company as opposed to being the president? <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because when I was the vice president of the company, I made I mean, Dr. Chen gave me a, a ton of leeway. I made 99% of the calls. I, you know, I dictated salaries and bonuses and all kinds of other, you know, very important things. But what it allowed me to do when I was the vice president of the company, it allowed me to become friends with my employees. And that's what made the change when I became president and needed to lay people off all the much harder. It's because there wasn't that layer of, you know, that level of separation between mm. myself and everybody else. And look, everybody wants to be everybody's best friend. I get it. Um, it's just so much harder when things go poorly if you don't have some level, level of separation. And those are two really harsh lessons I learned very early on. Um, you know, I, was in, I wasn't even 35 before those things happened. So now in theory, in my, you know, in my mid 40s, um, I'm the, I'm the old grizzled guy. You see me, Anthony, I have a gray beard here. Um, but I should be around for another 20 or 30 years. Um, you know, I'll, you know, God willing. Um, and I hope really and truly all I hope to do is give these lessons to other people because I don't want them to be unprepared. And I, you know, I have mentored so many businesses as, as they started out and I keep giving them the same advice that I, I'm like, man, don't make the same dumb mistakes I did. Don't do all the stupid things that I did. Oh, what's that? Oh, hey, here's I trusted this guy mm. too much, or I did this too much, and, you know. And I just tell them, come to me, please, please come to me. I'm not going to ruin your business. I'm not going to buy your business. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just trying to help you, because I truly believe in people. I truly believe that people are better when they're working for themselves. I love entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are the coolest people you're ever going to meet. They're going to give me more information, more business, more anything else than I could ever hope for in my life. You know, and I know that every given day that I, that I work with everybody I, I talk to. And so it's just so special to me to have that kind of relationship with people where they look up to me. I mean, fortunately, I've been president of ACEC. ACEC is a fantastic organization. Mm -hmm. I've been the president of ACEC of Florida, not the whole thing. Um, but knowing, sitting around other business owners just gives you a great mindset. And, you know, I love sitting around other business owners, but I really love sitting around those small business owners right as they're coming out of the gate and everything else, just trying to help them do these things. Because I think there's so many great things that can happen. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I, you know, as an entrepreneur myself and a business owner, obviously all that stuff makes me feel good hearing you say all that stuff. And really what I think is powerful too, what you said there 
and I'm learning that now myself as EMI grows is you really realize you have a responsibility, you know, for the people that work for your company, that that's their livelihood. That's their families. You're basically helping them support their families and keeping the company going. And so, you know, it's a, it's a big responsibility, but it's also very rewarding as you keep it going. And as they tell you about things that they're doing, they're buying a new house, they're doing things and you feel really good that you were kind of part of that and keeping the company going. And that's, Mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing better than that, quite frankly. We had a, the biggest stock exchange in the, in the history of our company was in 2017. When Dr. Chen retired and uh, nine individuals bought into the firm. So to make then a total of 11, now we have 12 shareholders. But um, that very first year after the, the additional nine shareholders, there's 11 of us. We, uh, we, we had a nice holiday party. It was on this very nice yacht. And uh, we went up and down the intercoastal in South Florida. And uh, I, walked, I walked over to each of the new shareholders and I said, hey, look at this, you know, this party that was going on and everything. And I said, isn't this cool? And they said, yeah, it's great. Everything's happy. You know, they had probably had a cocktail in their hand. And I said, you're responsible for their lives. <laughs> and every, every one of them stopped dead in their yeah. tracks. And I said, you know what? You're responsible for their lives. So don't screw up. And this is the responsibility that I've been living with for almost 20 years. And every one of them to a person took that to heart and understands that, you know, as a shareholder of the organization, we have a responsibility to perform, to make sure that everybody there is, is, is protected and taken care of. Obviously, I feel that most, most harshly, but, you know, again, now I'm the gray haired guy, so I can point at people and tell them, tell them, you know, funny stories like that. Yeah, no, sure. And then. And it's all, you know, really inspiring stuff. And I hope those of you out there that are thinking of aspiring to ownership in a civil firm, because I know a lot of our listeners are, um, you know, these are just things that you'll you'll think about and you'll encounter as you go through it. And you may not think about it as a younger engineer saying, hey, I want to be a partner. I want to be an owner. But there are a lot of responsibilities that come along with it. And you'll you'll certainly learn those. So. All right, so let's let's switch gears here, Peter, because I feel like you and I could talk about entrepreneurship for a couple more hours, but we can't do that. So let's talk about you're a nominee for the ASCE president elect in 2021, which is exciting. I'm I'm a very active ASCE member, so I'm excited to talk to you about that. Let's I got a couple of questions for you here, but let's start off with, you know, can you talk a little bit about kind of your vision as a nominee? I mean, what is it even like? I mean, I can't even fathom it. Talk a little bit about it. Sure. So, I mean, ASC and I have been together a very long time. Um, I've served in every geographic role from being um, the secretary of my local branch all the way up through being the uh, regional director um, for the Southeast United States and Puerto Rico. Um, I've served as a governor on one of the, uh, on the Utility Engineering and Surveying Institute Board of Governors. So I've served in every level of ASC. I've served on over five national committees. Um, ASCE is a very large and important organization and has many relationships throughout the world. It's not to say things can't be improved, but I have no illusions at all that a one-year president is going to make any kind of title change in a 169-year-old organization. I do have a few small changes that I like to see because I really think in order to turn an aircraft carrier, it starts with small changes, you know, one degree at a time. My platform is made up of three, three concepts. Um, I like alliteration to help people remember things. So I call my, uh, I call my uh, proposal accountability, advocacy, and accessibility. I think overall, I think accountability is important because I think accountability, um, ASCE is a membership organization. I think ASCE should provide member value to the members. I think that the organization should spend within its means. I think that the ASE headquarters and the, the staffing, I think we're overstaffed and I think our headquarters is too large. But I it really, in general, I think that what we need to do is set a baseline budget. And I think our baseline budget needs to pay for everything that is responsible for, for membership. And I think everything on top of that are the investments that we make for great things. We do some great things like the report card. I mean, God, the report card's been mentioned 7,000 times in the Biden infrastructure plan. Um, we do great things like that. We're doing the future world vision. We do some other great things. But I think all of that needs to come from conscious investments that are on top of the baseline budget that we need to have for our membership. So to me, that's what I call accountability. Advocacy. I think advocacy is at the heart of everything we do. Civil engineers are the most selfless pre- profession in the entire planet. 
We need to go to the mountains and we need to sing from the highest mountain about how great we are. And people who are civil engineers are terrible at doing that. I'm clearly not, but I think we, we need to make sure that we do is we have somebody who's in place that has that attitude. We're gonna be in there, we're gonna be a bulldog. We're gonna be in front of everybody. And on three levels, I think on our national level, I think we do a terrible job. We, we talk about having all these national partnerships. We have these national partnerships with ACEC and APWA and all these other things. We don't actively act on those. And I think we need to make sure that our, our, our national partnerships are really active partnerships. On a state and local government relations level, um, it depends on the state. In some states, ASCE is the bee's knees, man. They are the ones who do all of the work. In other states, ASCE is clueless. I will tell you right now in my state, I have been the state ASCE president of the state of Florida, and I do not want ASCE's state and government relations for getting involved in what we're doing because ACEC and FES, the NSPE version, um, have, you know, we have a staff of 15 in our state capital and we have five lobbyists. So, you know, you're behind the eight ball when it comes to that. So I think we really need to pick and choose our battles. And lastly, on, a on an international level, I think this is one of the really things that people need to understand. ASC is an international organization with over 50,000 of our members being from outside the United States. I think we need to make sure that ASC is the leading voice for civil engineering internationally. Last but certainly not least is accessibility. The civil engineering profession needs to be accessible to everyone. And I don't care if you're black, white, or purple. I don't care if you're male, female, or you don't identify. I don't care. The civil engineering profession is an amazing profession. It needs to be accessible to everybody. And the only way we're going to get there is two ways. I think we need to make sure that we specifically build our bench. Because as you start looking at, as you start looking at leadership positions, you have to make sure those leadership positions are backfilled by, the, by quality people. If the quality people aren't already in those positions, you, you can't get there. So we need to make sure that we're starting to talk to through the K through 12 education. You can't be an engineer in college. You can't be a civil engineering major in college if you've never heard of it in high school. You can't start thinking about civil engineering majors and getting your, you know, getting your classes and everything organized in, in high school if you haven't heard of it when you're in middle school. We need to make sure that the K through 12 education is perpetuating. Everyone is accessible to civil engineering. And then the last thing, we've done a really great job recently. I was on the board of ASCE when we promoted all board level committees are required to have a, uh, a younger member on the board, uh, on each of the committees. Um, younger members are 35 and younger. Um, I still feel like I'm a younger member, but apparently <laughs> I'm off by, by almost 11 years now. But um, I was chair of that committee, by the way, for a while. Um, but I also want to see that happen for our Mosaic committee. And our Mosaic is our diversity and inclusion committee. So I really think that we need to have a diverse voice and a younger voice on every single national committee, society level committee that we have. So those are the kind of, you know, again, accountability, advocacy, and accessibility are my three-level pitch and what my vision and my, my platform for ASCE are. That's great. No, I, and I love, you know, using those three words. I, I agree in the world of information overload. It's good to be able to clearly identify things. And, you know, a couple things. I mean, as, as a member for a long time, I think advocacy is something that a lot of too many civil engineering professionals, especially younger professionals, don't even know what the word means. And I think that that needs to change kind of to your point in terms of how important that is. I really think that that's, that is important. And, you know, someone needs to get out there and shake that up a bit, because I do think that it can be an exciting part of our profession for people that don't even know that that's something that they can do as a civil engineer, which, right. you know, we need to, we need to change that a little bit. And the other thing too, that you said that I think is important to kind of restate is, I don't think it's an understatement to say that most ASCE members don't know that ASCE is international. Like they just don't even know that, that we're outside the lines, so to speak. Yeah. And so American Society of Civil Engineers is a international organization. Right? So it's a little odd to say, you know, I mean, but. But, you know, but they do have some great opportunities, you know, international. I think like to your point, more members need to be aware of some of those things and, you know, be able to help out with some of those opportunities because quite frankly, I think, you know, a, a challenge of any organization that ha is large is, you know, not leveraging the knowledge and all of the membership. You know, I mean, I agree with you 100 percent. We got to definitely serve the members, but the members also can be served by being open to these opportunities that maybe that they don't know exists. And so it sounds like that's part of what you want to do is making those connections, which I think is great. Yes, sir.
Yeah. So that's exciting. So, so good luck with that. And obviously, you know, we'll be keeping in touch with you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pause for just a minute. Then we're going to put Peter on the civil engineering hot seat and wrap up with a few career related questions. We'll be right back. All right. We're back with Peter Moore, president Chen Moore. And we're having a really spirited conversation here about all things civil engineering business. And but we're going to talk now about career. We're going to put Peter on the civil engineering hot seat. And Peter, I'm sure you're ready. Am I right? I'm ready. All right. So, Peter, are there any specific rituals you practice every day? Do you have a specific morning routine, lunchtime ritual? I know we talked a little bit about some, you know, how you set up your day, but is there something you do consistently on a daily basis that you feel has really contributed to your success? Yeah, I think I do two things. I think um, in the morning, I think it's really important to make sure that you're grounded. You know, I get up and I take care of, I take care of my dog and I make sure that I, you know, get things ready for my daughter before she wakes up and everything else. But um, in the shower, I, I really do have a very long conversation with myself. Um, thankfully, I have one of those tankless water heaters because some days my conversation goes on way too long. But I, I really set up what my day is going to look like in, in my own head in, in the shower every morning. Um, and then the other thing that I do, and it's going to sound a little crazy to everybody, is um, back in the day, I used to send myself voicemails, but now I send myself text messages. But at the end of every day, I will often just send myself a text message that says, do these six things tomorrow. And the reason why I do that is because it allows my mind to be free at night. Because if not, I wake up in the middle of the night and I start thinking about these things. And if I don't get that off my chest and I don't, you know, I don't send that stuff to myself, then I start worrying about it. And I said, oh, did I think about that? So those are the two things I think that I do best. And those have been, honestly, those have been godsends for me over the last 23 years of my career. That's great. Yeah. And I really like that last one. I do this something very similar with a whiteboard and it's very helpful from getting stuff out of your head somewhere where, you know, it's not lost and, but it lets you to free kind of free, give you some headspace. It was, is, it was funny when I used to do the voicemails because I would, you know, I would call myself and I would say, Hey jerk, remember to do this or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and in the morning I get in the office and I'm again, we talked about the fact that I'm an early guy. So here I am in the office at six or seven o'clock in the morning. I look down, I'm like, who the heck sent me a voicemail? And I listen to it, and there's myself <laughs> yelling at myself first thing in the morning. I said, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. That'll get you going, yeah. That'll get you going. Um, all right, so Peter, what's one book that you might recommend or, you know, one book that you may have found helpful for you personally or professionally that maybe, like, you know, sticks out for you, if there is one? So there's two sets of things that I'm going to say here. Um, I love, and this is it's a fictional book. Um, but I love Ayn Rand. Mm. I love um, really and truly I, Atlas Shrugged and just the, the pure I don't know, factualness of it um, helps me put a lot of things in perspective. And I really think that, you know, the nihilism and everything else that she had but behind it was really important. Um, I've read a million great books, Jim Collins and all those mm. other things. And I, I really do love those, those type of books. But I think to allow your mind to escape some and to go something towards a good book is, is really important. The other author that I'll point you towards, and it's going to sound a little strange, is a guy named Brad Meltzer. Um, Brad, uh, actually, Brad's wife was in the leadership program with me, and I was able to hear him give a podcast. Well, he gave a TED Talk. He gave his version of the TED, uh, TED Talk called um, How to Write Your Own Obituary. Hmm. And I encourage everyone who's listening to this, I encourage you, Anthony, to listen to this. Um, Brad Meltzer, he's a New York Times bestselling author. He's super famous now and everything else. Back then he wasn't as famous. So he was cool. You know, we could hang out and have a beer. But um, and really the whole thing about that talk and all of his books have the same thing. So he's written some amazing books about, he writes fiction. He writes specific nonfiction related to trying to make sure that people understand who the, the little people in the world were. But all of it comes together because of this one TED talk that he has. And it really is all about impact. And it talks about the fact that, you know, you're going to impact your family. You're going to impact your friends. You're going to impact the people that you work with. But how often do you impact the people that you only see a couple times a year? How often do you impact the people who you only see once in your life? And do you have a life that impacts people you never, ever going to meet? And civil engineers have a life of impacting people that we never meet all the time. And I think it's so important for every civil engineer to understand the responsibility 
and the benefit that comes from being someone who impacts people's lives every given day. It just fills my heart full of love. All of Brad's work based on that. I mean, you, you read his great stories about all the things that he's doing. He's a super interesting, super funny guy. Um, I really can't say enough about him. I steal his lines all the time. I apologize to him all the time, but fortunately I do know him well enough to apologize to him. Um, but those are, those are probably what my favorite things are. That's great. And I, and I love you kind of reinforcing that about civil engineers, because I think sometimes we get caught in the projects that we're working on and we forget the people that the projects are impacting. And it's always, it's always good to bring that to the forefront for, for people. So, Peter, thinking back on your managers of the past, if you were to think about, you don't need to name anyone, but if you think about kind of your favorite manager or managers in the in your engineering career, what was it that made them your favorite? What were the characteristics? What did they do that made you remember them or that made you really enjoy working for them, if you can remember that? So it's, it's interesting. Um, I've had very few managers in my life um, because I basically, when I first, my very first job, um, I worked for my friend Terry and, uh, he gave me a job, but he was, he was running a branch office by himself. So it was just, the, there was the four of us. I started, it was, I was the junior engineer, but I was like, when I came in, I was kind of above the secretary and the CAD tech because that's what they still called them back then. Um, you know, I was able to interact with the principal from day one. And then I went over and I started working for the company I'm currently with 21 years ago. Um, so I basically worked for, for Dr. Chen pretty much straight away. Um, there were a lot of things that were frustrating about working for somebody else. That's the reason why I like being in charge. Um, but really the, the things that frustrated me were, and these are the things that I try to avoid, mm -hmm. are making sure that uh, expectations are dealt with every day that everyone understands that what their expectations are in, in any given day. I had days in which I'd get to the office at 7 a.m. and I'd finish my work by 9 a.m. and I wouldn't get markups on my plans until 6 p.m. And, you know, that was a little frustrating because I said I could have done this all day. Um, you know, and so understanding how your employees work is just as important understanding how the managers work. Mm. Um, being able to share work like that is really important. So these are a lot of the things that we put into our own company as, as we move forward. Um, you know, I'm, I've found myself, I want to be accessible 24 hours a day. Um, it's not great and my wife hates it, but um, you know, the, the fact I had an employee that started with us and he came on board and said, Hey, my boss, I, I came on board and it was actually one of our land, one of our first landscape architects that joined us. It's actually the second landscape architect that joined us. This hmm. story is important because his boss had just gone on vacation and he felt he could go on vacation because we hired the second landscape architect. Um, I'm a civil engineer and I have no idea, you know, what the, you know, the scientific background behind some things that landscape architects do is. But, you know, he reached out to me at eight o'clock at night one day and said, look, I have this proposal that's due and I didn't know what was going on. And I sat down and I helped him rewrite it for the next two hours and sent it back to him and he said, you know, no one in my previous job had ever done that for me. And I said, look, sometimes just being there is more important than being right. Um, mm. I just walked him through the process. Whether or not we achieved the right number, I, do, I can't tell you to this day whether or not we made money on that job, I don't remember. But I was there for him. Um, and being there for people is probably the biggest thing that, that, that all that reminds me of. Um, you That's know, great. And then, you know, honestly, you know, coming to uh, coming to Chen, um, now Chen Moore, you know, future, we're called CMA now and a few other things, but um, providing people opportunities, you have no idea the power of providing someone an opportunity and what that does for them. Because an opportunity, people will run through a door for you for an opportunity and making sure that you never cease to keep having opportunities for people in your organization is so key. That's great. No, those are awesome. And, and it's, it's great to hear you say that, you know, and it's, it's a good learning experience for everyone. You're going to encounter managers that aren't great, but they can help to shape you and make sure that you're not like that when you get to the next, you right. know, the next step in your career, which is great. All right. I got one final question for you, Peter. We call it the civil engineering career 
elevator advice question. If you got into an elevator with a civil engineer, you know, they're really looking to become a leader in the industry. You had about 30 to 40 seconds with him or her, and you had to give them some advice on kind of their leadership endeavors in civil engineering. What would you tell them in that short period of time? I tell them to get involved in ASCE or a similar organization, because I think they're going to give you free leadership and management training. But the very virtue of going through and organizing events, organizing meetings, organizing anything else, public speaking skills, all of the soft skills that you don't learn in college, you're going to learn by going through a professional society, a professional organization. And it's going to be an incredibly safe environment because people are going to back you up. That's awesome. All right. I was only again, on four floors right there, man. I got like six more floors to go. <laughs> <laughs> You got, you've done this before. Um, once again, Peter Moore from Chenmore and ASC nominee for ASC president elect in 2021. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and trying to give some great advice out. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Always good to see you, my friend. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the civil engineering podcast on YouTube produced by the engineering management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.